Hello and welcome to our online services here at Cornerstone Church and a special welcome to you if you are joining us for the first time. I appreciate that we're still living in very strange times at the moment and that affects the whole rhythms of all of our lives and I know it's particularly difficult for those of you who are living on your own. But I'm conscious too that God remains a faithful shepherd and guide to his people, even in these challenging times. He is not distant. He's not far away from any one of us. He still cares for his scattered sheep. Listen to these words from Scripture, from Ezekiel chapter 34. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them, As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on their mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep, and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Lord, we are grateful that you are a good shepherd who never leaves us unattended nor alone. Provide for us, lead us to your streams of living water. Comfort us with your Holy Spirit and feed us with your living word. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, we're now going to listen to members of our congregation sharing from Psalm 23, followed by a wonderful new song written by Phil Moore and Glenn Scrivener, which speaks of God as our Savior, Redeemer, our Shepherd, and our Father. And may this moment minister into your hearts at this time. My shepherd, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 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 He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Form a stand. 
mistakes we can't forget And the sins that still beset We have a lamb We have a lamb For our fault and anxious realm Well, what an encouraging and uplifting song that is. Well, we're now going to pray for Chris and Kessia Payne and their four children who are serving the Lord over in Japan for OMF. They send their love and their thanks to Cornerstone for praying for them. So let's uh, bow our heads and let's pray for them now as a family. Lord, we are thankful that Chris has been able to travel again within Japan and to visit various missionaries. 
We pray that he will be a blessing and an encouragement to all those whom he meets. And that in this busy time of traveling, that he would be given strength and stamina. We pray too for his witness with a, a local man who follows another religion. And we pray that Chris would be given wisdom to know how best to show him the true light of Jesus Christ. May Kessia too be given boldness in her witness as she begins to meet with people again after their lockdown. And for their children, we give thanks that Karis has managed to get a place at the International School and can start in August. We pray for Caleb and Jonathan to be able to cope with their online learning whilst they're away from Hebron School in India, where they would normally be studying. And we pray for Hebron School as they seek to recruit enough staff to provide their online learning and support. And we ask your blessing and help for Magubi in her studies too. Lord, help the family to be patient in their trust in your provision for their needs. And finally, we pray for the need that they have for new premises for their church plant and that a suitable facility would be found before the end of August for them. May the church in Japan continue to grow spiritually deeper during this challenging time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the work that our overseas workers are doing, and indeed the many ministries that Cornerstone is involved in, is supported purely from the giving of people. And if you would like to contribute to our work and our ministry, then details for doing so are on the screen now. Or indeed, you could visit our church website, and there's more details there on how to, you can give. Now, next week, we start a brand new series called Power and Profits. Now, since our services moved online, we have been producing separate videos and teaching for our children. But from next week and over the summer, we're going to trial a slightly different model. We will be incorporating the children's work within this, our main online service. Now, these services won't look drastically different, uh, but they will include a children's song most weeks and a children's slot based on the passage uh, that the sermon will be on. Uh, suggested activities for your children to do during the sermon will be made available on our website at cornerstonekids.co.uk. On Tuesday the 14th of July at 6pm, we will be showing the premiere of the Cornerstone Cabaret on YouTube. So join us with the whole family for a half hour of fun. Enjoy some fab performances from some very talented folks here at Cornerstone. All of the performances were recorded in people's homes. Well, let's turn again in praise as we sing together that wonderful song, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Well, do grab your Bibles, and as I read the passage uh, from Romans chapter 13, which Rue Miller, one of our ministers, will be speaking on in just a moment. So Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will, be, will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. 
For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command they may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Well, thank you, Colin. And uh, please do keep your Bibles open at Romans chapter 13. And I wonder what you were thinking as those verses were read to us just now. I wonder, were you mentally objecting to what you heard? Raising all sorts of questions, even as Colin was still reading. Ha- hang on a minute, was, is he really saying that, what about, does that mean? You see, I think this passage of scripture is one where we in our culture today are perhaps most likely to feel uncomfortable. To feel as though we want to object to what's being said, to qualify it, to soften it, maybe even to discard it altogether. Actually, these are are verses that Christians have wrestled with for centuries. One theologian put it like this. It is only a slight exaggeration to say that the history of the interpretation of Romans 13, 1 to 7 is the history of attempt to avoid what seems to be its plain meaning. And that may be our instinct this morning as well. To immediately launch into a long list of objections and exceptions to these verses. And we will, in time, come to look at some of the more difficult applications of these words. But before we do, I I want us to spend some time looking at what the Apostle Paul actually says here. And as we do, let's, let's remember that our approach as we come before God's word is not to sit in judgment over it. To, to pull out the bits that we approve of and discard the rest. No, rather, we come to God's word in humility, willing to sit under it, to listen to the Lord as he speaks to us, and to be obedient to him as we seek to live out the lives that he has called us to. And we need to recognize that 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 will sometimes mean we are challenged, sometimes rebuked, and that we will sometimes need to change our attitudes and our behavior. And so let's come like that to Romans 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Paul's instructions to the church in Rome are pretty clear, aren't they? And just in case we've missed it, he repeats himself even within this one verse. What it looks like for those Christians then, and indeed for all Christians everywhere, to live in view of God's mercy 
to be those who are, are willing to be living sacrifices. What it looks like when it comes to secular government is to submit. To recognise the role that God has given them and to willingly live under their rule. And you know, it's that context that we saw in chapter chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that is crucial for us here. This whole section of Romans has been about fleshing out what it looks like to live in view of God's mercy. What it looks like to be those who take the good news of Jesus seriously. To be those who, who live in light of all that has been laid out so far in the book of Romans. And in these verses, the particular part of the good news that forms the bedrock of our response to secular rulers is God's sovereignty. We are called to submission in light of God's sovereignty. I wonder, did you notice how many times we're told that God is in charge in these verses? The authorities we are to submit to are those God has established. They are established by God. That's twice in verse 1. They're those God has instituted, verse 2. They are God's servants, verse 4. God's servants again in verse 4. And a third time in verse 6. In a passage that is apparently about how we respond to those who are in charge of us, it is very, very clear who is in charge of them. God's supreme sovereignty forms the backdrop for all that we are called to here. Throughout the the book of Romans, we have seen the lengths that our sovereign God has gone to to restore humanity to rescue us from the toxic effects of our sin, to reorder this creation that has been so eroded and damaged by our rebellion against him. And it's clear here that human government, the institution of human rulers, is part of God's good provision for us in this world. Verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. God has given us human governments in order to promote good to encourage the the flourishing of humanity as we live together on this earth. And he has given us human governments in order to restrain evil, to limit the damaging effects of our sin, and to bring some measure of his ultimate final justice forwards into this world. Under his overarching rule, God has instituted human government for our good. And so the call here is is to recognise his hand in that and to do all that we can to assist our rulers in their role. You know, it's incredibly fashionable today to be cynical about those in authority. At every level, from, from our parents while we're still in their home, through our teachers at school, to the management in our office, to councils and regional leaders, our national government and the various international bodies to which we belong. Our culture calls us to be cynical, to distrust authority, to assume that they are fools and that they cannot make good decisions. I think of all the times I sat in the staff room in my previous job and listened to my colleagues tearing the management to shreds over their latest decision. Not because of some carefully considered objection, but just because they're management and we're not. And so often I felt the temptation to join in. It is just so easy to take a pop at those at the top. 
but we need to feel the challenge of these verses. For the Christian, there is no room for such cynicism. Our default response to authority should not be mockery or dismissal, but rather respect and thanksgiving. God has acted to limit the effects of the fall in this world. And human authority is one of the tools that he has used to do it. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. But of course, we do have to ask, what are we to do when faced with rulers who perhaps not only fail to acknowledge the Lord, but are actively opposed to him? Authorities who who do not rule as Paul describes here. They do not commend those who do right. They do not punish the wrongdoer. How are we to respond to those in authority who are not acting for our good? Well, again, the backdrop of God's sovereignty is vital to our understanding. Verse 1 is clear. There is no authority except that which God has established. And so we must recognize that that every regime on this earth, however powerful, however corrupt, however abhorrent, is still subject to God's authority. Time and again throughout scripture, we see that the Lord is sovereign over all rulers including those who directly oppose him and his people. Think of Pharaoh in Exodus, or the kings of Assyria, Babylon and Persia. All of them fundamentally opposed to God, determined to defeat and crush his people. And yet all of them, ultimately, subject to God's will. All of them ultimately playing their part in God's plans for his people and for the world, whether they knew it or not. All of them ultimately answerable to God for their actions, subject to his supreme authority and justice. And nowhere is God's ability to work through the actions of of sinful, ungodly rulers more clearly seen than in the death of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter addresses the crowd at Pentecost, he pulls back the veil and reveals what was really happening as Jesus was subjected to a sham trial and an unjust execution. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. See, the Romans and the religious leaders in Jerusalem, they had all the authority. But God was still in charge. Through their wicked and evil actions, our sovereign Lord brought about the salvation of the world. Praise be to God. Our brothers and sisters around the world living under repressive regimes may take comfort from the fact that their rulers too are subject to God's sovereignty. In North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Yemen, Iran, India, Syria. All places where the ruling authorities are fundamentally opposed to the living God and his people. In each of those places, we may be certain that Yahweh is still sovereign. Those leaders have have not somehow bypassed the Lord's rule. They are only in power as long as the Lord allows. And they will one day stand before his throne 
to answer for their actions. But in the meantime, just how are believers to respond in such situations? How are we to live under rulers who propagate evil and sin? Well, again, the sweep of scripture is rich with examples of those who have submitted to their earthly rulers while submitting supremely to their heavenly king. Think of Moses before Pharaoh. Think of prophet after prophet before the rebellious kings of Israel and Judah. Think of Daniel and his friends before the kings of Babylon, John the Baptist before Herod, Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, Paul himself before Festus and Agrippa. Time and time again, we see God's people submitting to the authorities of their day and yet still standing up for justice, for righteousness, for good, willing to stand and to speak truth, God's truth, to power, even if it costs them their lives. And again, nowhere do we see that more clearly than in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout his ministry, he resisted calls to join with those bent on the violent overthrow of the Romans. And yet he also so clearly challenged the rulers of the day held them to God's standard and and called for justice and equality in the society in which he lived. He bowed the knee to no one but his heavenly father. And yet he submitted himself to the so-called justice of Rome, confident that it was God's justice that would be fulfilled in the final reckoning. And so then, let that be our guide as we seek to live in light of God's sovereignty. Paul does not call us here in Romans 13 to to mindless, unthinking obedience, but rather to respectful submission that sees our earthly rulers for what they are, God's servants for our good. Give to everyone what you owe them, If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now we don't have long left at all to look at the rest of chapter 13. But I do want us to take a moment just to see that the section we've looked at isn't some random aside about human authorities, but rather it it is a practical outworking of all that Paul has been saying about how we are to live our lives in view of God's mercy. You see, it would be easy for us to to read Romans 12 and 13 and, and come away with a list of rules that Christians have to follow. Use your gifts, practice hospitality, don't be proud, don't seek revenge, honour the authorities. That's all in there. But the final two sections of of chapter 13 help us to see how all of those behavioural instructions, all of those things that, that Christians are to do, are grounded in the good news of Jesus. What we are to do is made possible by who we are now able to be. Let's read again from verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt of love to one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. You see, the whole of Romans 1 to 11 was about establishing how we could be right with God apart from the law. Keeping the rules was was never going to work for us. We simply can't do it. And yet the paradox we find in chapters 12 and 13 
is that the life Christians are called to live after they have been saved through Christ will look in many respects remarkably similar to keeping the law. And here we see why. Because although we will never be able to put ourselves right with God by keeping his law, his law still remains his good and righteous guide for how we might best live our lives. And the effect of of the gospel, the outcome of the good news of Jesus Christ, is that we are now free to live lives like that. Free to be joyfully obedient to our Lord. A right view of, of God's mercy, of his kindness to us in his Son, allows us to love as we were made to. To love others as as though we have a continuing debt to them. We have never loved them enough. Such love is the fulfillment of the law. And so this call to love will look like humbly serving within the body of Christ. It will look like practicing hospitality. It will look like seeking peace and not revenge. It will look like submitting to our earthly rulers. Precisely because we know we are loved with an everlasting love, we are free to live our lives as living sacrifices, giving ourselves to God and to others. And more than that, a a clear view of God's mercy calls us to action Now, we must live these lives of love now, not tomorrow, not next week, not when we feel like it, but now. Because one day soon, Jesus Christ is coming back. We didn't read it earlier, but but let's take a look now at verse 11. And do this. That's all that we've read in chapters 12 and 13. Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. There's a lovely little story of a young boy who heard a a broken clock strike 13. Running to his mother, wide-eyed in wonder, he exclaimed, Mummy, it's later than it's ever been before. It's later than it's ever been before. And friends, that is the perspective that we are called to this morning. This very day, we are one day closer to our Lord's return. One day closer to the moment when he will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. One day closer to the time when every knee will bow to him and every tongue will acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. The day when all the wrongs of this world will be truly righted. When every power will submit to him. The day when we will feel the warmth of his smile as he welcomes us in as his good and faithful servants. Dear friends, it is later than it has ever been before. So I urge you, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. In all that you do and all that you are, use your gifts to build up the church. Be devoted to one another in love. Live in harmony with one another. Be subject to the governing authorities. Put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Not because you must, but because you may. This is your true 
and proper worship. Let's pray. Almighty, sovereign God, we come before you today in humility. We come in repentance. We are sorry for all the times that we have mocked and ridiculed and dismissed those you have put in authority over us. We come in thanksgiving. We thank you for restraining evil, for ordering this disordered world. We thank you for instituting human government. And so, Lord, we pray that by your spirit you might work in our hearts, that we would know what it is to willingly, joyfully submit to those in authority over us, even as we submit to your supreme authority. And Heavenly Father, we do pray for our brothers and sisters around the world for whom that is especially difficult because they live under repressive regimes which persecute them for their faith. Lord, would you give them great endurance and perseverance? Would you comfort them with the knowledge that you are ultimately sovereign and that one day all those who who perpetrate injustice will meet with your good and perfect justice. And Lord, we pray that we might be those who live in light of Christ's return, recognising that it is later than it has ever been before, devoting ourselves to you and to others in view of your great mercy to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing together now a song which speaks of the one who is truly king, ruling and reigning over all creation. Let's sing. Sways from pole to pole at war 
yours may cease and all be proud and praise his reign shall know no end and round his pierced feet fair flowers of paradise extend the fragrance ever sweet Die.